Ah, there we go. We're here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, Ally. <laughs> I'm Joanna Penn. I'm here with David Penny, who doesn't look anything like on a Ross. Hi, David. Hi, Joanne. <laughs> we finally managed to get this working. We, you know, two people who are quite technical, <laughs> failing miserably to start a <laughs> hangout on time. <laughs> yeah. We're only three minutes late. We're fine. We're fine. Yeah, actually, yeah. pretty good uh, yeah. considering our tech issues. But um, here we are. We are doing the. Oh no! Oh. Mm? Oh wait, sorry. Did you just hear that? That was us actually on YouTube coming through my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I've turned it off now. So. <laughs> um, we'll pretend that we've only just arrived. Uh, so, <laughs> welcome everyone. And we are doing the Alliance of Independent Authors Q and A monthly Q and A for the 29th of September, 2015. Honor uh, is at Nink, so uh, that is why David is standing in. Now, uh, I do this every month, um, but David, some of you might not know. So David, just give us a bit of a, who are you and what do you write? So everyone Ooh, knows who you are. Blimey, I, I, you didn't tell me, you didn't warn me of that question, Joanna. That's <laughs> no, not fair. Um, I'm David Penny. Uh, I used to write science fiction uh, 45 years ago. Uh, I was a traditionally published author, I had four novels out over a five year period and then I just kind of gave it all up and went to work and, and real life intruded and I never really lost the uh, hunger to write so I've come back to it now but I don't read science fiction anymore so now I write uh, historical thrillers uh, and uh, uh, I've got two out currently and a third one in development. There we go. So, and I think that's interesting because you you kind of represent someone who's rediscovered the joy of writing and mm. and self publishing in this in this new uh, time, which you couldn't have done back then. No, exactly. When you that, did the first book, so I think yeah. that that is awesome. So, what we uh, what we do at the beginning is we talk a bit about publishing. You know, what's happening in the publishing world, and give a bit of an update as to what we're up to. And I always think that's really important because. Uh, it, one of the most important things in this ever-changing space right now as, as authors and publishers is listening to people who are actually in the weeds doing this themselves. There's so much advice out there from people who are not actively writing and publishing and marketing their own books. And I think that's super important. So we always try and keep it real here on the, on the Ally Q&A. So um, just to start off with the updates in the publishing world, the big thing that's happened is Oyster the subscription service folding and Mark Coker came out with a oh the sky is falling and we love Mark Mark's been on my show um, yeah. saying another competitor to KDP select falls by the wayside but I'm choosing to see this in a positive spin because the main people at Oyster have gone to Google so could this be a renaissance of Google Books which uh, a couple of months ago now kind of shuttered the doors to new publishers and it's you know it just kind of nothing's happening so I I'm choosing to believe that this is the beginning of a new Google Books. What do you think, David? I think so too, yeah. Uh, from what I can tell reading around, uh, Google have taken over pretty much the entire Oyster technical team. And I mean, this either tells me that um, they were absolutely genius programmers that Google want to snap up, or more likely Google want to shortcut their entry into a, into a lending service of some kind. So uh, I, I choose to, to go with the latter. So I think um, Google is planning to come back with a, a, a competitor to, um, to KDP, really. I do too. I think it's yeah. a, a positive spin. And I mean, I think in general, you know, it's, it's kind of better to be, have a, pub, a positive spin on these things or you could just get super yeah. depressed. <laughs> Indeed. Whether, whether Google comes back, with, I, I don't think they will continue using Oyster's business model. Mm. Which is which pretty much led to the fact to them closing the doors themselves. Uh, they're more likely to go to something like a KDP model, I suspect. But uh, yeah, we'll but just have a better have a better back end because I mean I've tried yeah. Google book Google Books. It's just uh, awful. I mean it's just oh, terrible. Yeah. yeah, it is. It, it, it's it's awful from an uh, an author's point of view to actually get something up there uh, even before they close their doors. Yeah, and it's awful from I mean. a user. Yeah, it's all awful from a user's point of view to actually buy stuff as well. To some yeah. extent, 
So yeah. I do think that hopefully that will be a positive spin. And an, another, I think, positive thing this week, well, I certainly took it positive, but then I'm a glass half full person, is the uh, author earnings who put out a, yeah. have put out two reports this month. Uh, and of course, whenever they do, everyone goes, woohoo. Um, so there were two reports. The first one uh, showing that something around 35 to 42%, I think, of ebooks in the Kindle store have no ISBNs. And that means they're not counted in all of these surveys that say ebooks, um, ebook sales are dropping. So that's uh, what I found the most interesting thing out of that survey. And the other survey showed that a if you were, if you did debuted in the last three to five years, you're more likely to make better money as an indie. If you debuted over five years ago, you are more likely, from what it looked like, to be making better money traditionally published. Is that how you took it? I think it is, yeah. It's, it, it's, it looked pretty obvious from the, the statistics they provided. Um, and, and I've been all over Facebook this week trying to put people straight because they keep quoting that New York Times article <laughs> that says, Oh, it's the end of the world again, you know. Ebook sales have dropped cataclysmically, but of course they're only looking at um, at the statistics given out by the publishing industry <laughs> and books with ISBNs, as you say. So it, it, yeah, the ebook sales have actually risen, but nobody would know it if they read the press. Yeah, but our but in the indie share of the market is the bit that's grown. Mm. Uh, mm. I mean, we've seen. I think we've seen it. Too. I mean, we're in, we're both in England. And we've seen prices of um, ebooks since that, since the agreements with Amazon and Hachette and all mm. that this mm. earlier this year, last year. The ebook prices have just rocketed up, and we've seen debut yeah. authors, you know, ebook sales at nine ninety nine, which is about fourteen US dollars, yeah. which is unbelievable. Who's going to pay that much for a debut author's ebook? I mean, I wouldn't yeah. even pay that for my friends. <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> I don't either. Um, funnily enough, I bought um, the Jack Reacher book last week, mm. and I think I paid six forty six pounds forty nine for it. Mm. And I almost didn't do it. Uh, usually, I, I will pay up to about a fiver for yeah uh, a book I really want to read, uh, yeah. and no more than that. Seven ninety nine US. Yeah, yeah. So it was a bit late. Yeah, it's probably close to four something then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Jack Reacher I found quite disappointing. Uh, it's it's be, <laughs> he has written twenty of them now. <laughs> yeah, and, he's really, uh, he's really over it. <laughs> I mean, he does admit it's formulaic. <laughs> I must but, say, uh, you know, I yeah. was like, come on, Lee Child. Yeah. But yeah. there you go. Uh, anyway, yeah. um, we should. Uh, was there anything else in the news? Oh, I guess the other amusing news story this month was the self-published authors don't write four books a year. Did you see that one? I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which uh, a bit of a stir, didn't it? I know. It's um, it's quite weird because I, I I haunt the Kindle boards quite a lot. Oh, do you? Um, You're one of those. I see. I never um, go there. It's too negative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only only lurk. I don't actually. Well, I do contribute, but not very much. Uh, but there's people on there saying you've got to write a book a week, a book a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't I imagine what, what their quality control must be like. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a happy yeah. medium. And I think yeah. in terms of what this means to everybody listening, what you have to think, all this stuff, okay, one, things will change. Things will continue changing every week, every month, uh, every year. There will always be more books. Um, we're in this renaissance of creativity, you know, mm -hmm. in all kinds of areas. And the most important thing is just keep writing, keep focusing on doing what you enjoy, and uh, don't look to the left or the right. Just keep going and uh, keep doing what you love. And yeah, I mean, uh, there's no other advice for it, really, is there? I mean, if you no. don't enjoy this, get out the kitchen as yeah. such. Yeah, you should you should write first and foremost because you love writing and you want mm. to do it. But I, I keep seeing lots of people who say, um, how do I earn uh, $1,000 a month? Or how do I earn $10,000 a month? And they're not particularly interested when people turn around and say, well, you have to write a good book and you have yeah. to market it and you have to, it has to be, you know, and then you do another one and another one. And they say, oh, no, no, I, I, I want to write a book and, and earn $10,000. Yeah. yeah, there's all these people on here saying they're earning this sort of money. Yeah, and I but I think you know, as somebody who is earning really good money, I have fifteen books. Yeah. So yeah. that you know, that's the point. It, it's yeah. not okay. And the people I know who are making very, very good money have twenty-five books, forty books. Yeah. 
and they've yeah. been writing for a long time. So I think, you know, the message for writing has never been get rich quick. I mean, it really hasn't. Mm. What it is, mm. is build your intellectual property assets month on month, year on year, and yeah. something may happen if people mm. like reading them. So um, you know, I think that is sound business advice. Keep writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. get back in the office. Get back in the office. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing listening to this? Yes. Okay. So just a, a quick update. So I am, I mentioned last month that I am doing my first co-writing novel at the moment. So I'm co-writing with Jay Thorne, who is an indie horror writer. And one of the great things about being an indie is we can do whatever the hell we like and we can do our own contracts. We can work with whoever we want. Nobody can tell us what we can and can't do. So Jay and I are writing a, it's a a, a dark fantasy thriller set in New Zealand and it's called Risen Gods and it by the next ally uh, chat it should be out or at least on pre-order because we just finished first draft well we're gonna finish first draft this week and I can tell you know the listeners now Orna reckons I'm too much of a control freak to do this <laughs> but it is brilliant what's it's intoxicating to the word count that you generate with two people it's oh, yeah. just amazing. So we've got 60,000 words in three weeks, basically, and a finished first draft that's really interesting and the collaboration of two minds. So I'm going to do a lot more of this. I, and I was convinced by James Patterson for everything everyone says about him, the guy knows how to tell a story. And uh, oh, yeah. yeah, so I'm totally convinced on co-writing, going to do a lot more of it. Um, what have you been up to, David? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not quite as productive as that. Um, I'm trying to do 2,000 words a day at the moment. And that's, more very, or less, that's hardcore. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But I, I, well, it, when I really get into it, I did 10K one day. Wow. But, um, I'm more or less keeping my 2K. I'm, I'm on book three of the Thomas Barrington series. Uh, it's called Sin Eater, and it's about as dark as, as they're getting darker as I go along. I, I, I remember listening to you speak, and you said you'd stop self censoring yourself, Joanna. And uh, I thought, what a great idea! <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to that, David, because both you and I are known for being kind of jolly, smiley types, but actually, yeah. we, that's not our shadow side. Oh, no, no. When we shut the door and we sit at the keyboard, <laughs> the bats come out on our, on our shoulders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh good i'll look forward to reading that that will be right. that'll be one i'll definitely read okay so uh we have questions um i will uh let's start with larry's uh larry is from australia and he says is there an indie mm. book fair scheduled to happen here anytime soon so um this is a kind of a global question uh, what about indie author events uh, around the world what do you think it's, it's, it's a sort of timely question because uh, I don't know if you know or if anybody else knows. Um, Orna runs the indie, what has become the Indie Author Fair. It was called Indie Recon mm. uh, up until last year, and we've renamed it Indie Author Fair. And Orna, Jay Artel, and myself are organizing the first events for next year now. Okay. Uh, at the moment, we have plans for online one day conferences and these are going to tie in with the major publishing events such as London Book Fair Frankfurt and uh, Book Expo in America. Sydney uh, has a Sydney has a book festival it's very good. Yeah, Sydney Writers yeah. Festival, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, we're also want to organize a live event around at least one of those a year whether we do more than one year I don't know because mm. it's the logistics of it as much as anything else. Uh, uh, at the moment, there's no decisions made, but I do know that Orna is very keen on opening up Ally to, to a global audience and, and to global participation. So the answer is, Larry, at the moment, we don't know. <laughs> but maybe come back in a couple of three months' time and we might have some more details of exactly what it is that's going to happen. And also, I know that, um, I mean, one obviously, this is a global organisation. I think we have members in, I want to say, 40 countries, but I might be wrong, but it, quite getting a lot. That, yeah, yeah, getting I mean, off of that, yeah. This is a global organization now, obviously when there's not a, I mean, we have people in India, but India is a massive mm -hmm. country, so to have a meetup in India, you know, uh, so I would say that I think we are having meetup.com, there's gonna be an ally umbrella where you can organize your own local events um, mm -hmm. under the ally umbrella, and that's a really good thing to be doing. Um, and I mean, just because we're English and, uh, you know, we're, it's, 
because we know each other locally, but there's lots going on internationally and many of us do travel to different events. I could even be in Australia in 2016, uh, <laughs> back down under. So, uh, you know, there are things that we can be doing, but I would say definitely part of being in an organization as well is volunteering to do stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you want to organize something locally, then definitely email and uh, or you know jump in the facebook group and say you know i want to have a meetup in sydney for example or or whatever so okay yeah. that covers that one um I, did, well, I was just going to say that yeah. we're spoiled a bit living in europe because we can like you say we can hop up on a plane or even a train and be in pretty much any other country within a few hours not quite the same if you're living in australia or, or somewhere where you know, it's, it's 3,000 miles from coast to coast. It might make oh, yeah. the logistics more difficult. I know. I lived in New Zealand for seven years yeah. and Australia for four years. So <laughs> <laughs> I came back. <laughs> but, um, okay, next question. Uh, Paul says, I got an email from the Agency for the Legal Deposit Libraries requesting five copies mm. of my book. I mm. did a bit of digging and this seems to be something I need to do. Are you able to tell me a little bit more about this as it came as a bit of a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> to me as well. Oh, do you know anything about this, David? I probably did the same sort of digging that Paul did, I think. Um, okay. it, it, I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't at all aware of the requirement for it. I did know that all published books should have a copy deposited with the British Library. Mm. Uh, and that appears to be a legal requirement in the UK. Uh, having I guess you're regretting it now. <laughs> having, having said that, I am breaking the law, if that's the case. <laughs> I, yeah, and I would say again, this is an interesting ISBN question as far as I'm yeah, concerned yeah. because um, I remember this happening to me when I was in Australia. I actually bought ISBNs way, way, way back when I first self-published. Uh, and then because I'm, Orna and I fundamentally disagree about this, so the ally line is we you should have ISBNs as an author. I choose not to use them. So I use free create space ISBNs for my print books and I do not use ISBNs for ebooks or audiobooks. So that's my choice as an uh, indie author. So what happens when you have your own ISBNs is yes yes you could get contacted mm. or yes there mm. is that legal thing. Mm. When you're published by create space and I think the ISBNs they use must be registered in America or something, you don't get that. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say that's that's why I haven't had the letter yet. Yes. It, so I think it, that's what yeah. so in your create space as well, are you? Uh, well, I was. Uh, I'm, I'm now on both that and Ingram Spark. So. Uh, oh well, then you're going to get the letter if you own your own ISBN. Probably, yeah. It will be based on the country that you're in and the legal requirements mm. around that. Um, mm. But yeah, certainly, uh, what I think is hilarious, of course, is these people. Um, these notices are going out, but where are they going to put all these books? Very soon, there's, there's going to be so many of them. So yeah. I, I would expect this is one of those laws that stems from the Middle Ages or something when there was only about three books a year. <laughs> I think I think when I looked it up, you're probably right, actually. It does go back several hundred years at least. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but the, the most recent one was 2011. They mm -hmm. changed the law because they're looking at um, digital content as well now. Well, I have had requests to digitize the Creative Pen as mm. part of a library archive. And of course, mm. I'm like, yeah, sure, go ahead. Mm. Mm. Um, and of course, there's the Wayback Machine. I don't know where that is um, mm. uh, held, but you can go on the Wayback Machine and have a look at websites from years ago. It's really funny. <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> <laughs> Including my own, which is funny. Yeah. Mine as well. Is it? Interestingly, yes. um, the, I noticed when I was doing a bit of research on this, it, I see that the requirement to request copies must come within 12 months of publication. And I took a look at Paul's book uh, and it's within a week of being outside of the 12 months. So if they'd left it another few weeks, he would not have had to have um, complied with this by the look of it. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the author has to pay for that. So for five books, if you say you write a fantasy yeah. novel, you have to get five print copies mm. and ship them to that address. Mm. So, mm. so pain in the ass, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next, uh, next question. Uh, Rex says, I have written... Uh, yeah. I've written five short stories between 1,000 and 3,500 words. How many more should I write before submitting for publication as one collection? Um, so on this, Rex, I would say um, it depends what you mean by submitting for publication. So if you mean submitting to a short story press uh, or magazines, then uh, the short story authors I know submit 
each short story individually to magazines. You know, there's lots of information online about places to sh submit short stories. So um, I would be, if you want to submit for publication, that would be the way to do it. Submit them individually to the markets where they buy short stories. And I know a number of authors who write, you know, a couple a week and, you know, make a couple of hundred pounds on each story. What's nice is when the rights come back, you can then put them into your own collection. So if your question is, how many more should you do before self-publishing in a collection? Um, my answer to this is usually, what is the value to the customer and how much are you charging? So I have a short story collection, which is three short stories, and I put that up for free. And the reason it's for free is it's a way to try my writing and it's got a link to one of my novels in the back. Uh, and I also do audio of those stories and I use them as promotion. Now, if you've got five, uh, say you've got a book that's going to be around 12,000 words, that is very short. That's not even a novella. So I would be thinking that has to be a 99 cent type value. If you look at the price of a full length novel and how much reading time people get out of it. Now you could make that two ninety nine, but I don't think you could sell that for four ninety nine. I, I would really think that would be too much. What's your opinion on this, David? I, I think pretty much the same as you. Um, I've, I've been. I think you mentioned it a little bit, and I've been looking at uh, some other people saying that the, sh the short story might actually be making a bit of a resurgence, with particularly uh, self publishing. Mm. Um, I know Hugh Howie is certainly a big fan of short stories mm. and um, I think what people say is that you know they want to read on their phones on the commute into work uh, or, or when they go to bed just before they go to sleep mm. and and they don't have time to read a whole novel but a short story gives them that kick of um, reading fiction in, in quite a short period of time so yeah I think you're right though that you <sighs> You can't charge very much for uh, even a three and a half thousand word short story if you're no. self-publishing it. Yeah, it, it would be difficult. Yeah, I think Hugh Howie actually publishes them individually. He does, yeah. And I think they're 99 cents, but mm. he is Hugh Howie and he's now yeah. famous. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, what you could do is have, you know, say you, so you've got five, I think. So put two out for free and then mm. put three together as a 99 cent and then you'll at least make something or put mm. two out for free and then write a couple more and put a book of five that would probably yeah. be the best way to do it but um remember also with things like short stories if you are going to uh, do them publish them separately you can do free book covers on something like canva.com mm. c-a-n-v-a.com decent covers oh sorry it's my phone <laughs> just unplug it <laughs> oh um, amateur is amateur such amateurs um yeah so um or because obviously if you're doing short stories and you're not even able to really charge much for them mm -hmm. then uh doing your own covers on something like canva uh, or buying those really cheap covers that are sort of you know you just have to change the words on them that's mm -hmm. actually a better mm -hmm. idea i mean i wouldn't be spending you know no. 300 500 dollars on a book cover for a short story no 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 me it, uh, it it's it's just not cost effective is it at all no, be crazy. So there you go. But anyway, I agree with you that the short story is definitely having a resurgence. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's something I keep, because I, I really enjoyed the three short stories I wrote, which was for Dan Brown's launch of Inferno with oh, Hobo, right. which was amazing. And I really enjoyed it. And I thought, I really want to do this again. This is very liberating to write shorter. But, um, <laughs> but as a businesswoman, I'm like, I'd rather write something bigger that will I sell know, for more money. <laughs> I've, I've tried writing short. I used to write short. I used to have shorts in things like Galaxy Magazine and so on. Um, but when I try to write short now, it ends, it always ends up as a novel. So <laughs> I just submit it to, to fate and don't yeah, bother just, anymore. Yeah, do what yeah, do what feels right. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Nancy says, what is the typical length of the blurb summarizing the book content? Mm -hmm. Would you like to start with that? Yeah. Uh, for me, basically as short as you can possibly make it to, uh, and to punch hard. Um, Interestingly, uh, you know Brian Cohen, don't you, Joanna? Yes, he was on the podcast talking yeah, about this very yeah. topic. I, I signed up for him to do both of my blurbs for my oh. existing books, which was a very interesting exercise um, and quite a, a pleasant exercise because he could hardly change anything. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, 
which he could, but he did, however, improve them um, with a few tweaks here and there. But for me, I think blurbs should be typical length, two, three hundred words, maybe tops. Any more than that, uh, and you're going to lose people. You with a blurb, you don't want to have to. You're not trying to explain the entire plot. You're not like, trying to name every single character within the book. It, you have to have a, a, a hook at the very start, uh, find out who's in it, and another, um, this is Brian taught me this, uh, a buy hook at the very end of it so that people will go out and, um, and think, yeah, that's great. Think of it like a movie trailer. <coughs> and movie trailers normally run somewhere around 30 seconds. So you're looking to write something that is not going to take anybody more than half a minute to read. That's my take on it anyway. I don't know about you, Joanna. Uh, I think for fiction, yeah, really, I mean, I think about my buying habits mm. now. Um, I'm, I'm a shocker now. I probably own even, I, I make a lot of decisions based on cover and title, yeah. really. Yeah. I mean, less and less am I reading the, I might even read just the one line, especially, I mean, it's partly because of Amazon's design. They changed it so you can only see a very small mm. amount at mm. the top now. Mm. Um, but what I tend to do is, is judge on sample anyway. So I, I download, like yesterday, I think I downloaded about 20 new samples. I have hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of samples yeah. on, my, on my devices. Yeah. And yeah. I will judge, you know, I will go in and I'll judge it on a sample. So your, your blurb is super important in that it has to hook people enough for them to download a sample on Kindle. Mm. Um, with nonfiction though, I think nonfiction yeah. is a bit different. Yeah. Uh, I actually, tend to say to people to include more, especially, you know, include the table of contents, include more what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to remember that the, um, that description field is metadata, it's searchable by the algorithms, and um, certainly Nick Stevenson recommends doing an, uh, mm -hmm. like an author Q&A mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. So even if people right. don't read it, you, you get 4,000 characters, so why don't you use it to include metadata that will encourage the um, alg algorithm to read more into your book. So one of the things on my list is to go back through all my blurbs and not to expand the blurb, but to put underneath the blurb in the same field an author Q&A, uh, mm. you know, what, what are the mm. authors that have inspired you to write, Joanna? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can you get away with that these yes, days? Yes, yes, you can. Oh, right, right. In, in that format. Yeah. So at the moment, that format is still allowable. Also, people use that the bottom of that to say bestseller in these categories, yeah. which once again yeah. give you the keywords mm. that you, mm. you, you want. So I think, mm. think about it in two ways. One is, yes, you want to hook people to download the sample, and two is metadata algorithm fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Um, Okay, there's a we're coming on to oh one last Natalie says how about a non marketing question what are some of your favorite <laughs> writing craft resources oh, yeah. well this is a tough one so what are your favorite writing craft resources uh, you got a book or a something you particularly like I've got lots um, I remember I met you Try not too long ago and we had a conversation about this but <laughs> <laughs> um, I went and checked my bookshelf yesterday when I saw this question and I've got 31 physical books on craft there uh, and then I had a look on my Kindle and I've got probably twice as many on yeah that. me too I have hundreds. Uh, and I've got you know I've got Robert McKee's um, story and Blake Snyder's Save the Cat and and so on and, and I got like I say I, I'm, a, I'm an absolute nut for reading craft books and, and doing craft work really but that that's not everybody's the same as me and so uh, my recommendations of what you might want to look at could well easily differ from somebody else's but um, funnily enough although I've got a lot on Kindle I don't buy them for Kindle anymore I always buy in print mm. for that sort of book I read fiction on the Kindle almost mm. exclusively but once I, I've got a book I want to use as a reference book I always go out even if I've got it on the Kindle I will go and buy a second copy in print so that I can write on it and put highlight points and put sticky notes in the corners to say come back and look at this in the future so yeah lots of them lots of them but um one of the problems i think with uh, craft books is after a while you tend to err towards really 
complicated ones. Oh, yeah. That are huge, you know. Um, but there's some, the on writing by Stephen King, for instance, is a great one. Even though I disagree with his notion that you should just sit down and start to write. But, but I, who am I to disagree with Stephen King? <laughs> he's, he's a pantser. But, um, he is a pantser. I think we agree on Sean Coyne's The Story Grid, don't we? Yeah, we do, yes. Uh, I've gone back to that just recently and, and given it a bit more attention. It is excellent, yeah. Really, Very good indeed. Really, and yeah. in fact, it started me outlining. I didn't use to outline. Oh, right. Now I use yeah. I use the the story grid by Sean Coyne, um, his uh, one page full scap thing, which uh, Stephen Pressfield uses, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and then I use Blake Snyder's Save the Cat as a. I kind of have a hybrid plot which uses mm. both of those two one pages almost yeah. Uh, yeah. and that's what I used to do the outline for this co-writing project which has really forced me into outlining because you have to communicate mm. what's in your head with the other writer so very interesting process it is yeah yeah and, uh, well, I was also going to mention though it's probably worth going back to maybe some of the simpler or some of the summarized books about people like um, K.M. Wheeland and um, Libby Hawker, who've taken the, the bulk of these big uh, detailed books and kind of streamlined and pulled out all of the information that is, is an essential to use. Uh, I actually read K.M. Wheeland's book before I start any new one, <laughs> oh, <laughs> simply okay. because it's, it's thin and it, it's, almost bullet pointed you know and, and you can just take that and if you if you follow all of the links that she provides you end up with a bookshelf of 50 books <laughs> and which but, particular uh, one of her books do you recommend that's that's i can't remember <laughs> she <laughs> has quite a lot <laughs> I, she has yeah uh there's it's the one on structure i believe okay right yeah. fantastic well people can have, look it, her. have it on my desk at home where we should be doing this but <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, and then Natalie also says, and a follow-up uh, marketing question. So a little bit now on marketing. Um, we hear a ton about mailing lists these days. What are your experiences with mailing lists? Building them? What do you send? Frequency? Uh, so um, I'll start on that. So uh, oh, again, start <laughs> again, it's a, a fiction, non-fiction. These are different things. So with non-fiction, it's very easy. Um, you offer something that's useful. And if you're writing in a non-fiction niche, it's very easy to be useful. So write something free that's useful. People sign up for your list in order to get your freebie. So uh, at thecreativepen.com, I have a big freebie, the Author 2.0 Blueprint. It's very useful. People sign up, then they get a whole load of videos and emails and links and loads of free information and uh, so that then goes out in an autoresponder series and then I do a monthly update newsletter -y type thing where I give more useful information so for non-fiction it's really about being useful inspirational that type of thing providing information about your niche Fiction is very different in that, um, again, you provide something for free to get people to sign up. I have Day of the Vikings for free uh, on my website, jfpen.com. And then once people sign up, I do a monthly newsletter. I say newsletter because what it is is interviews with other thriller authors, so things that they, that they want. I also do book recommendations um, and I do giveaways. So they're things that the reader actually wants in the genre that I write in, but it is much, much much harder to build up a fiction list than it is a non-fiction list because it's not easily searchable it's not easily findable you don't know who your target market is necessarily until you have found out who they are <laughs> um, you know people who like this type of author and that's one of the questions I ask when people sign up for my list I say tell email me and tell me what other authors you like because then I figure out who I can try and interview on my blog another time um, uh, or try and network with and get in their newsletter, for example. So these are some little tricks you can do. But essentially, um, this is nothing new. Everything that people have been saying about mailing lists has been the same for years. Um, you know, give away something for free in exchange for an email address, contact them regularly, and then tell them when you have something to sell. So that's pretty much it. So, David, uh, do you have an email list? Are you building that? I do. Uh, I, yeah, well, building is, is probably the wrong word. <laughs> do you have, have you got a form on your website? I do, yes. And it's on every single page of the website. And I think I might have 
oh, close to a dozen people signed up to it. <laughs> That's excellent. An excellent but start. It is, yeah. But I actually don't have, I don't have any giveaways on it, which uh, is a, a bad move. So uh, I am actually putting together a, a short story, funnily enough, um, which is, is going to be a prequel to the 10 book series I'm writing. Thank and you can you. only get it by signing up to the mailing list. Fantastic. That's a perfect example. And, and that's also an important point to people listening. David has not got that list. And we are on book three of this, of your new mm. incarnation. Mm -hmm. you, you have a form. You only have a few people on it. But you have a plan to write something new that will feed into a 10 book series. And what is your plan in num the number of years that this will take? What, to write the 10 books? Less definitely less than ten years, or to write the short story. Do you mean? Well, to do you know you, you what yeah. we're saying is this is not a I'm just going to rush into this. This no, is a yeah. plan for a series and a giveaway that matches your yeah. series, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the giveaway is going to be prior to the launch of the third book. Okay. Uh, the ten book series. I'm hoping to do two a year. Okay. Brilliant. Um. So within four years' time, I should be finished. I've got them all plotted. Uh, and it takes oh, wow. me about two months to do the first draft of each one. That's fantastic. And I think mm -hmm. what the point is there, that's a great timing because, and I would say for fiction authors, again, there's no rush. I mean, for nonfiction, you can bash out a freebie really quickly mm -hmm. and put it up mm -hmm. there and it will, you'll get signups because you're in a niche. Whereas with fiction, exactly what you're doing is right. You're not going to sell any real volume of books until you have three books anyway. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is correct in that um, when you have three books, I would suggest that you put your first book for free uh, as a promotion and that that first book contains a link to your free giveaway and says you know if you enjoyed this free book come and get another story mm -hmm. um, so that you're you've got that perma free which leads to this nice story ties into the whole series and two more books that they can mm -hmm. go and buy then you'll actually you're actually probably going to make some decent money with three books I would have thought uh, well well we living hope living hope well, <laughs> I, like <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly different in that I don't it sounds terrible. I don't need to make money. No, no. I mean, so you're it, in a different time. It, it would be very nice. Yeah, it would be very nice to do so. Um, <laughs> yeah. I told my wife I was going to make 10 grand next year. But <laughs> <laughs> well, Just that's... So she doesn't hold me to it. No, that is cool. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, James, actually, well, this oh, is... Oh, very kind of timely, amazing. yeah. Yeah. So James says, how long does it actually take to see decent sales on Amazon Kindle? I'm a new author and my first book is barely moving. It has been available for three weeks. I Stop laughing. Sorry, sorry. I'm plugging it on all the channels and I have an ads campaign running. Uh, and we'll get to question two in a minute. Um, so, David, as somebody who's been through this uh, roller coaster twice mm -hmm. and as an indie author, um, how long did it take you to see any decent sales on your first book? Or are, uh, you, are you there yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'm outselling James. I did look him up. Uh, I that. but, uh, but that's not saying much because my book's been around for 18, the first book's been around for 18 months. So yeah. you would expect it to, to have built a, a, some sort of momentum by now. Um, it, it was very interesting because I did take a look at James's book um, and the fact it is about four weeks old now. Uh, it, I think it's expecting a lot to think that you're going to make sales that early on with a single fiction book, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. It's going to take time. Like you say, <clears throat> really, you need three books in a series or three books at least. Um, I did... <sighs> I'm not sure what ad campaigns James is running, and I'm not sure what he says when he says he's plugging it on all the channels. If that simply means he's tweeting several times a day, here's my book, why don't you go and buy it? I can probably understand why it isn't getting a lot of uh, momentum behind it as yet, because that's not the way to do it. Mm. I think just in general, th this is a, a switch between what used to be true under the traditional publishing model, which mm -hmm. is all the sales had to happen in the first month, and then it would drop off. Mm 
Mm. And so your expectation as an author in a traditional publishing house, and if you now work in traditional publishing, you expect a spike and then a drop, and then the next author gets their go and they get a spike and a drop. For indie authors, it's the opposite as far as I'm concerned. In month one, mm. You barely do anything except try and get reviews, as far as I'm mm. concerned. Or even mm. the first six months of your first book, you try and get reviews by giving away as many books as possible. And in fact, the best way to get reviews is to get a few up front um, and then put it on perma free to try, or at least if you're just on um, Amazon Kindle using KDP Select, then you know use your free days. You will get reviews if the book is free and it's got a decent cover and a decent description and it's a good book mm. 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 so that would be my thing is you would not expect to see decent sales until you've built up enough reviews for it to have <coughs> social proof it's got it's got some algorithm juice remember that if we're looking at digital online sales the algorithm has to learn about you it has to learn about your book the fact that it's just sitting there means nothing it has to mm -hmm. learn from the people who buy it so you almost doing an ad campaign to send traffic to the book is great but if people get there and there's no social proof that it's good they're not going to buy mm -hmm. it anyway mm -hmm. so what i would say james is uh, three weeks is nothing, a month is nothing, six months, you know, I would just focus on building up the word of mouth and the, you know, the review count on the books. Once you've got enough reviews, you can then buy buy promotions like uh, Free Booksy, Bargain Booksy. You could look at BookBub, although they are even more hardcore. Mm. Most of the books mm. that BookBub promote are years old. Every time, I mean, I put stuff, I put um, Stone of Fire up there. That was published in 2011. Because it's got like 400 reviews, it's the book that they want to promote. So mm. that's the way to do it is to think long term. And when you've only got one book, especially with fiction, the best thing you can do is write more books. And mm. as David's going to do with three books, then you can start to really pull out all the stops and do some promotion. Mm. But um, yeah, I just, I wouldn't expect to see if it's nonfiction, then you can do a lot more as in you can do guest blogging, you can do podcasting. If you have an audience already to buy it, then yes, you will get a spike in month one or week one. But, um, you know, it takes a long time. To, I mean, I can hit the bestseller list now on day one by sending an email. But I've been doing this for uh, eight years, nine years. <laughs> Yeah. I, I have an audience, so I don't just have one book anymore. But my first book, you know, pff, nobody knew I existed. And I spent yeah. two years learning marketing before I sold any books, basically. Mm. So what I would say is just, um, yeah, take it slow. <laughs> yeah. You're right. It's that recognition factor. You see it every week in the Sunday Times and the New York Times bestseller lists. Stephen King brings a new book out and it hits number one. Lee Child brings a new book out and it of course. It reaches number one. And that's the name recognition for those writers. And, and they're following. Uh, that's right. And, and at the moment, um, you, you probably don't have that name recognition, James. However no. good your book is, uh, however well written it is, you have to wait for that recognition to arrive, as Joanna says. And, and that only comes by proving yourself again and again and again. But yeah. hey, you know, yeah. on the happy side, this is a long-term career, right? This is not, mm. this mm. Is not a get-rich-quick. This is we're going to do no. this until we die because we love it. So what's yeah. the rush? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was talking to Lee Child at a conference recently, actually, and he said his first three books didn't sell. You, you think, you know, he's, he's a huge megastar of fiction now, but he's 20 mm. books into the series. Mm. And his first one had awful sales figures, so much so that the publishers almost didn't publish, almost didn't publish the second one. Mm. But just by being around and plugging away and doing book after book after book, you build that momentum that that starts to pay off in the end. It, it isn't a, it isn't an old. There's no such thing as an overnight success. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay, and then we're managing to go on longer than we expected, David. We thought we'd be done in twenty minutes. I talk a lot. <laughs> Um, okay, so James also says, when is uh, the showcase up and running again? <laughs> Do we Good know question. That? Good. Uh, we don't know. We have... Oh, I think uh, we, we know something, don't we? We know that there's going to be do. a form that you will... There is. There is a form. Uh, we've had some technical problems with it, basically. The form was in place last week. I had hoped to get it up and running the middle of last week, but... 
something in the toolkits we're using to build the forms and then automatically submit them didn't fit nicely with our websites. Mm. Um, so we had to pull the plug on them and we're currently looking at, uh, we're talking to try and get whatever the issue is corrected so that people can actually then log in, they can fill in the form, get submitted mm. and basically then Instead of us publishing a weekly showcase, it's going to be a rolling, um, continual showcase, okay, which would yeah. be better for everybody all around, I think. Yeah, I think that that will be, so basically, I think, I hope everyone can continue to realise that this is still an organisation in its toddling years, um, as the indie movement is, and um, I don't think, when, when Orna first told me about her idea around the Alliance, year, you know, years ago now, four, four years ago I think it was, and, um, and I was like, yeah, sounds like a great idea, um, you know, um, I don't think she ever thought that it would be as big and that this, this movement would grow so fast. So these kind of growing pains, trying to scale the website um, so that everybody gets a chance to put their stuff up, um, this will continue to happen as, we, as these things change all the time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like they do. Uh, okay, so uh, I think we had one more question, no more question. Oh no, I think that's it. Oh no, one more. Helen, when should you start thinking about publicity, marketing and promotion mm. for your book? Which mm. kind of ties into the... James's question. A bit James's away, question. Right? Yeah. yeah, so again, I mean, what, so David, do you want to have a go at that? I can have a brief one, but I mean, you're the expert on this, Joanna. You know far more than me, but I would have said it's never too early to start thinking about it. Or never um, too late. Or never too late, indeed, no. You can have a book out for five years and then suddenly decide to mm. put some publicity out about it and to market and promote it, and, and things can take off. The, the, the beauty of self-publishing and, and, and the whole indie movement is that nothing ever goes away. Mm. Everything is there forever, isn't it? Well, and, we, and, we assume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the way the internet's been today, maybe we're not so sure. <laughs> uh, I, th I think there's three parts to this, really. Uh, Helen's asked about when should you start thinking about publicity, about marketing, and about promotion. And although they're kind of all three connected, I, I, I would consider them separate to some extent. Publicity has to come before the book comes out, I would say, so that people know it's coming out. Marketing is almost once the book is out and you're pushing it. And then promotion, again, is before and after the book comes out. So, yeah, as you say, I think you can start it well before, um, but it does. you don't have to start it until years after if you don't want to. And don't worry about missing it. I think yeah. a lot of people panic that, oh, if I don't start pushing my book a year before it's due, um, then nobody's going to buy it. And, and as we've seen with James, you will not sell straight out of the gate unless you're somebody that everybody knows. Yeah, or you've, or again, nonfiction is easier. So say you're writing a book on um, giving up smoking, you can start blogging and having a giveaway 10 tips to give up smoking on your website. You could, you could give away a packet of cigarettes. <laughs> Or not. Um, you could you could have that on your website for years before you yeah. put a book out, and you could yeah. have been building an email list up. So that, in a way, is kind of marketing to me. To me now, marketing I define as sharing what you love with people who want to hear about it. So to me, marketing for me is when I I like going to graveyards, which I like to share, and um, I take pictures in graveyards. So um, and then I put the pictures on Instagram or Twitter. That to me is marketing. I'm not saying buy my book i'm saying mm -hmm. i like graveyards yeah. people yeah. who like graveyards share those pictures and then people start to follow me then when i have a book out they'll they'll care whereas um i do very very little publicity in terms of anything kind of you know blah, blah, big launch mm -hmm. you know everything's mm -hmm. more subtle and i prefer it that way you know i don't like the, the hard sell type of thing so I think the point, like David said, is, you know, you, you can have just a baseline thing. You can drive people to an email list over time if you want to do a launch. But, um, you know, it will depend on what your book is. You know, for, for example, let's say if your book is about the American election system, then sure, you're going to have a deadline and you'll want it to come out. Or if it's like Orna's book was about the yeah, WB Yates yeah. Um, anniversary that had to come out on a certain time frame, then yes, yeah, sure, you need a real hardcore plan around your date. But otherwise, 
you know, I think sometimes you don't know what marketing to do until your book is out. I mean, certainly with fiction, I look at what I write sometimes and go, this, you know, I'm only just understanding what I write. Mm -hmm. um, whereas nonfiction is so much easier. So it's a very difficult question to ask. We probably haven't done an answer. We haven't done a <laughs> job of that. But <laughs> the point is you can always be thinking about marketing. And yeah. if you're not doing yeah. it, then don't yeah. worry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've, uh, I've got a friend who who is in LA, yeah, a guy called John Lynch, who is a very good marketer, and he he never passes up the opportunity to sell his book, but not sell it as in you know here's here's the book, can I have six ninety nine off you? Mm. As to sell himself and to sell his book, and he is he ought to he ought to do a, a blog post on it because he is absolute genius at it, absolutely. Mm. You can walk into a room cold and sell 20 copies. And that, I mean, I think some people have that skill. Mm. I don't have that skill. So mm. I rely on being useful mm. or interesting uh, in order that people who might be interested come and see things. Um, I might as well give up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but also both you and I, both you and I are relying on a series for our yeah. fiction. And yeah. a series is the most, I think, and there are lots of evidence for it, a series is the most powerful way to sell fiction because if somebody likes book one they will buy book two book three and i'm on book seven i'm about mm. to write book eight in my arcane series and i've got three mm. in my other series and this is the way to sell fiction uh, is and in fact non-fiction now you see mm. um, people putting books in series steve scott for example books on mm. habits um you know just keep serving the same audience with stuff that they want that's what it comes down to. I think authors need to just turn their head around and remember that there's a customer. How can you please that customer? How can you delight that customer or entertain them, help them? Uh, you know, that's the way to think about it. I think authors oh, yeah. can be so self-obsessed and yep. it's not about you anymore. It's about the reader. Exactly. I have a great big sheet of paper stuck above my desk and I sit down every morning and, and look at it and it says what does the reader want not what I want but you know what does the reader want what are they expecting from what I'm going to produce today yeah and mm -hmm. and if you're making the reader happy they will allow you to write another book because they'll buy the one that you've just put oh, out yeah. Oh, yeah. and so much so that we'll all end up like Arthur Conan Doyle and want to kill off Sherlock Holmes because they're <laughs> fed up to the back teeth with writing about the same character <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, there's two ways. I mean, Jack Reacher, yeah. like we said, he, and Lee Child is doing 21. He said he would do 21. 21, he says, yeah, 21. He said he would do 20. Yeah. I spoke to him this year at Thriller Fest, you know, yeah. Thriller Fest, and I yeah. asked him about that, and he kind of twinkled and <laughs> didn't say the thing. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think he's going to stop. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah. anyway, uh, so there we go. Any last words, David? I think we've... Uh, no, I think it's been, I've really enjoyed it actually. So that's, that's great. Yeah. I'll have to hope Orna has to go away more often. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we always, always have a laugh. So the, uh, the next show will be on the Tuesday, 27th of October. Uh, Orna should be back with a report from Nink. Uh, I'll be back with my, um, this will be how much co-writing I've done. And David will be at home hard writing, won't you? I will be, yeah. I should be almost 60% done by then, 70% done. That's fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much for your time, David. And thank you for everybody listening. And we will say good night from the Alliance of Independent Authors. And uh, yeah, happy writing. Good night.